Hello and welcome to lesson 8.2, Thermal Energy Transfer, video 2 of 3. So on your screens now is the slide we left off with last time where we determined the solar constant for Jupiter. So we found that it was 51 joules per second. That much energy is coming every second to every square meter of the surface of Jupiter, whereas for the Earth it was almost 1400, so a huge difference. All right, so let's move on. So the first thing we're going to talk about today is something called emissivity. Now, emissivity is going to be represented with the lowercase letter e. Now, the last time you saw a lowercase letter e representing something, it was eccentricity. When we were studying uniform circular motion and gravitation, the eccentricity of an orbit told us how close to a perfect circle that orbit was. Now, while the orbits are almost circular, they're still technically ellipses. They're not perfect circles. There are some points in, for example, Earth's orbit around the sun where it's further and some points where it's closer. Now, that value of lowercase e ranged between 0 and 1, where 1 was a perfect circle and 0 was well, as far away from a perfect circle as you can get. So in this case, we still are representing emissivity with the lowercase letter e, and it's still going to take a value between 0 and 1, but a little bit different this time. In the last video, we started talking about black bodies. So a black body is an object that not only absorbs every wavelength of radiation incident on it, but it also will re-emit all of that radiation. So if a body, so in this case a black body, so if a body has an emissivity of 1, that means it is a perfect absorber and therefore a perfect emitter of radiation. So that would be a black body. Okay. An example would be charcoal. Now, charcoal is not a perfect black body, but it comes pretty close at 0 0.95. What that means is 95% of the radiation incident upon it gets re-emitted. Okay. So it's not the ideal 100%, but it's pretty close. On the other extreme, if you can't absorb and emit that radiation, or if you absorb it and you cannot re-emit it, any combination of that, then you have an emissivity of zero. Something that comes really close is a mirror. It has an emissivity of 0 0.05. So whatever incident radiation you have on the mirror, only 5% of that will actually get absorbed. All right, now, at the bottom of the screen, you're gonna see two formulas and they're both for the emissivity. Now I know that the value has to be between zero and one. What that means is the denominator has to be bigger. If the numerator is bigger, you're gonna end up with a value bigger than one. So you have to have the denominator being bigger. And the denominator here is P black body. Okay, this is the power emitted by a black body. And at any point in time, the power that is actually emitted by a body should be either equal to, if it's a perfect black body, or less than that of the black body. Okay, so for example, charcoal, it emits 95%. So the power actually emitted by the body is 95% of the actual power it would emit if it was a perfect black body. Now, power of a black body, we can replace that with sigma at to the four, the Stefan Boltzmann law. We're actually going to amend that a little bit later on, but for now, just take it as is. Okay, so consider the following scenario. Imagine you have a small sphere and it's covered with something called lamp black. Now, for those of you that don't know, lamp black is just a black pigment from the incomplete combustion of oil, wood, or coal, and so fossil fuels. So essentially what it is, is it's a black pigment from soot. Now, you don't just necessarily collect it from fossil fuels, like the incomplete combustion of fossil fuels. You can also collect it from oily flames from candles and oil lamps. So here what we have is something called a tallow candle. And that just means it's made out of animal fat. But that's besides the point. And so originally the small sphere has an emissivity of 0 0.5. So that means that 50% of the radiation that's incident upon it will be re-radiated. So not a good black body. Now when you bring it close to the candle, okay, these oily flames can eventually burn onto the sphere and turn it into a fairly decent black body. Okay, so now it's covered with what's called lamp black. Okay, so now the emissivity is 90%. It increased uh, by 40%. Now, an even better black body than that, in the, well, the closest approximation we can get to an ideal black body is when you have a cavity inside a piece of metal. 
All right, so why is that? Okay, so you have some kind of opening and you've got that little cavity on the right side here, this little opening. When radiation enters, okay, so let's say it's uh, infrared radiation, it's heat. When radiation enters, it's gonna bounce around this perfect circular cavity. It's gonna heat up the walls and then the radiation is going to be re-emitted. Okay, so this is actually the ideal uh, example of a black body. Now, we are going to amend the stefan boltzmann law. So originally, when we saw it, the sigma at to the 4 is equal to power, that was for a black body. But as we can clearly see, sometimes you don't have a perfect black body. And actually, well, actually, I should change that. Not sometimes, usually. Usually, you don't have a perfect black body. It's either 90% of a black body or maybe 50%, whatever it happens to be. And so we're going to amend the stefan boltzmann law and include emissivity here. So whatever power you would have originally had, you multiply that by percentage, okay? so the percentage of radiation that is actually re-emitted. So this tells us how close it is to an actual black body. So if we get a certain power uh, of the ideal black body and we multiply it by 50%, then you get the power that is re-emitted. So this is a better uh, value that we can use in our calculations. Okay, albedo. In grade seven, eight science, you most likely learned about albedo. And if you don't remember, that's okay because we are going to review it once again. And when we studied optics and light in physics, we saw that when light hits the surface of a material, it's going to be, well, part of it will be transmitted and part of it will be reflected. And that transmission could be in the form of refraction. Now here, we're not going to call it uh, reflection. We'll call it scattered. When we dealt with reflection, we said that the angle of incidence of the light ray was equal to the angle of reflection. Now, in this case, scattering can occur at different angles because the surface of a material could be uneven. It doesn't have to be smooth. And so if the angle of light comes in at a certain um, well, angle, it can reflect at a completely different angle. So let's consider the following two scenarios. Assume you have a mirror and you have a certain amount of power coming in for that incident light a very small amount of it is going to be transmitted and become heat, and the rest of it is going to scatter. So most of the incident power gets scattered. A little bit of it becomes heat. And on the contrary, if you take a, um, a surface and you cover it with lamp black, almost all of it gets absorbed, and most of that incident power becomes heat. So very little actually reflects and scatters off. Okay, so by looking at this, albedo tells us how much of the light reflects compared to how much is coming in. And specifically, it looks at the power that is scattered compared to the power that is incident. And so in this case, we can see that the mirror has an albedo of almost one because it has scattered most of the incident light, and whereas the black body has an albedo of almost zero. So a real life example, other than the mirror and the, well, the lamp black covered material, would be ice. Right? So ice has a very high albedo, as we'll see uh, in the next slide. Okay, so there are a lot of things that affect the albedo of a planet. Okay, seasons affect the albedo. We're actually going to see that in specific detail on the last slide in this video. But also different types of terrains will affect the albedo. Okay? So for example, if you have, uh, looking at the first row in this table here, if you have tall grass in a certain region, it's going to reflect anywhere between 16 to 18 percent of the light. If you are dealing in a desert, it's the desert will reflect about 36 percent of the light. That is pretty, uh, pretty significant. OK, if you look at the bottom here, we've got sea ice and snow. Those reflect between 62 and 66 percent. That is a huge amount um, of the overall incoming radiation. Now notice that the ocean only scatters 7%. That's not that much. Okay. And here it is in the uh, point form. Okay. So snow and ice scatter 62 to 66%. Desert is 36. Now just think about that for a moment. Why is snow, why does it have a higher albedo than sea ice? Let's so take a moment and think about that. If you need to pause the video, go ahead. Otherwise, we'll talk about it now. Okay, so it's really simple. The reason why snow has a higher albedo, the reason why it reflects more of the incoming radiation is because ice is clear and snow is white. Okay, so things that are clear, they have a higher probability of allowing transmission as opposed to reflection. Okay. 
Now, satellites can actually be used to map out different regions on the Earth where albedo is high or it's low. Okay, so looking at this map, you can see based on the scale on the bottom right here, you can see that you have albedos close to 40% in regions on the map outlined with red. And you have albedos of close to zero, lower albedos, let's say, in green and yellow regions. So what we see is that in Canada, in Russia, and even North Africa, in some parts of the Middle East here, in Asia, you have very high albedo. Again, pause the video for a moment and just contemplate that. How is that possible? How do you have very high albedo in those red areas? Try to come up with a reason. Now, it might be easy for you to come up with a reason for the Canada and Russia, but see if you can figure something out for Northern Africa. That's a little strange. Okay, so pause the video and take a few moments to uh, ponder that. All right, welcome back. Hopefully you had a chance there to think about what's going on here. So if you figured out that the reason why the albedo in Canada and Russia is so high, it's because of there's a lot of snow. We have very long and significant winters. This is why you have such a high amount of reflection of the light in the north. Okay, so that also accounts for uh, Greenland up here. Now, that doesn't really explain why Europe is fine and then all of a sudden you've got another high, uh, high albedo region here in northern Africa. So why could that possibly be? Okay, so in northern Africa, if you can't think of what it is here, I tell you what, so a lot of scientists used to actually think that the reason why there is such a high albedo in northern Africa is because of the vegetation. And you saw on the previous slide, the table, actually having different kinds of vegetation can actually lead to a pretty significant albedo. But then if that was the case, then South America should also have pretty significant reflection of radiation. So that can't be it. It's something that exists in northern Africa that does not exist in South America. And it's something that northern Africa shares with different parts of Asia. Okay? If you figured it out, it's the presence of certain types of soil in the desert. Okay? So scientists determined that the presence of certain desert soils actually has a very high albedo, and that's why you have that red region in the middle of the map here. And that also explains why you have it in certain parts of the states and in Australia too. All right, so let's keep going on. Now, what you saw on the previous slide should have just shown you that it's pretty difficult to figure out the albedo of a planet. It's quite difficult already to determine the weather. And although we can predict it relatively accurately, there's always going to be some errors with the time. It's, it's never going to be exact. There are so many factors contributing to it. Okay, so when we look at albedo, there's other things other than vegetation and seasons that affect it. For example, clouds and even contrails. Okay, so a contrail, this is the trail of condensed water from an aircraft or rocket that's at high altitude. Okay, these ones will also contribute to the albedo. So on average, Earth's albedo is about 30%. Every day that value changes, and it changes based on your latitude, it changes based on the season, it changes based on what there is on the surface. And so there's a lot of contributing factors here. So we have talked about a lot of conceptual knowledge on this. Let's actually solve a problem involving albedo. Okay, so assuming an albedo of 0 0.30, find for the Earth, A, the power of the sunlight received. Okay, so going to our page here. Okay, so part A, we are looking for the power received, so P. Now the question tells us that the albedo is 0 0.30. Okay, so that means that from 100% of the radiation that comes in, 30% of that radiation gets reflected and 70% is kept. Okay, so since we're trying to figure out the power received, so I just put an R there for received, that means how much is actually kept by the Earth. Okay, so 70% of the radiation from the sun is kept while 30% is reflected, right? So just always keep that in mind. You're not necessarily using the number in the question, 
you got to think about what's actually going on here. Now, this problem is missing some information. And the reason is that we had already covered it in earlier sections of 8.2. Okay, so a really important piece of information we need to use here is how many joules per second per square meter are hitting the earth. Okay, so we found out that it's 1380 watts per square meter. That is the intensity of radiation coming from the sun towards the earth. Now, what I also know, since I'm trying to find power, I know that intensity is power per unit area. But what's really important here is that when you're considering the Earth, the intensity of radiation hitting it, it's not going to hit the entire surface area or the entire surface of the planet at the same time. It's going to hit a certain cross-sectional area at any given point in time. Okay, so the area in this formula is actually referring to the area of that cross section. If I take the Earth and I slice it, I'm going to be left with a circle, a circle whose radius is equal to the radius of the planet Earth. So A is equal to pi r squared. And this here in the numerator is my power received. Okay, so I'm going to rearrange that. So PR is equal to A times I. So A is pi r squared times I. R, like I said, that's the radius of the Earth, so that is something that you would look up, unless you've already memorized it. So that would be 6.38 times 10 to the 6 meters squared, and I is 1380 watts per square meter. This way we get the number of watts. Okay, so we have pi times 6.38 times 10 to the 6 squared times 1380. And we have 1.76 times 10 to the 17 watts. Okay. All right, so not too bad. So we've got that. Now, keep in mind that that's not our final answer, right? So that is the total amount of power coming from the sun. So actually, that tells me I should change these subscripts to T. This is the total amount of power coming from the sun. If the Earth didn't reflect any of the incoming radiation, that's how much we would receive. But since the Earth reflects 30%, we only keep 70% of this value. So to get PR, I have to take PT and multiply by 0 0.70. So that's 1.76 times 10 to the 17 watts times 0 0.70. So glad I still have that on the screen here. So multiplying that by 0.7, I get 1.23 times 10 to the 17 watts. So this is the power received at the surface of the Earth. Okay, the rest gets uh, reflected. Okay, let's go back to the slides. All right, part B, the predicted temperature due to the sunlight reaching it. Okay. So we saw in the last lesson, and also at the beginning of this one, that power and temperature are related to each other. And they're related to each other via the Stefan Boltzmann law. So if I know that the power received at the surface of the Earth is 1.23 times 10 to the 17 watts, I can figure out what temperature the Earth should approximately, approximately be at. So the Stefan Boltzmann law says that P is equal to sigma A T to the 4. Now, we're not going to use the one with the emissivity letter E in the front because I'm not given any information about that. So for now, we just have to assume that the Earth is acting like a perfect black body. Otherwise, there would be an E here, and I would multiply this entire product by an additional ratio. <clears throat> Excuse me, an additional percentage. Okay. Now, A, we got to be careful here. The A in this formula is not the cross-sectional area that we were dealing with in part A of the problem. Okay, this area is the area over which this power is emitted. And this power is emitted over the entire spherical shape of the Earth. Okay, so this power is emitted, well, it's absorbed and absorbed and then it's re-emitted, right? So it's uh, re-emitted, that means I'm dealing with the area of a sphere, which is 4 pi r squared. So we got to be careful there. So if I want to rearrange this formula for temperature, T to the 4 is equal to P over sigma A. So T is equal to the fourth root of P over sigma A. Now, I doubt your calculator can do fourth root, so the other way you do that is by taking 
that same ratio and raising it to the power of 1 over 4. So that'll be a bit easier. Okay, so P, there's my P, so I have 1.23 times 10 to the 17 divided by sigma. I probably should have left a bit more space there, but okay, it's all right. Sigma, that is your Stefan Boltzmann constant. So 5.67 times 10 to the minus 8. Yep, I should have left more space. Okay, uh, let's just write the area here. Area is 4 pi times r squared. So r is going to be the radius of the Earth. 6.38 times 10 to the 6. I guess I can close it there. Squared. All right, grab your calculator. Just make sure you're entering this stuff properly. 1.23 times 10 to the 17 divided by 5.67 times 10 to the minus 8 times 4 pi times 6.38 times 10 to the 6 squared. And close that again. There we go. 4.24 times 10 to the 369. So 4.24 times 10 to the 9. Now remember, I have to take this and raise it to the power 1 over 4. So I'm just going to raise it to the power of 0.25. All right, there we go. 255. Now, because I'm working in SI units, the value that I'm getting out is going to be in Kelvin. And the reason for that is because sigma is also um, has a unit that is in Kelvin. So 255 Kelvin. Now, in order to figure out how many degrees Celsius that is, you have to subtract 273. Right, so if we do uh, 255 minus 273, we'll have minus 18 degrees Celsius. Okay, so based on the amount of power that we receive from the sun, we would expect to have a well, an average temperature of minus 18 degrees Celsius on the Earth. Now, if you're looking at that and saying, well, that number doesn't really make sense. How do we have an average temperature of the Earth to be minus 18 degrees Celsius? We might enter that kind of temperature in the winter, but certainly not for most of the year. Okay, so what we have to remind ourselves of is that most of the Earth is water. And water is not warm. It's cold, especially at night. Okay, so that water is pretty cold and it covers most of the Earth. So factoring in how much thermal energy the water contains and how much the land contains, this is the average temperature. So it is actually a pretty reasonable value that we've calculated. Okay, moving on. So going back to the slides. All right, this is a new example now. If the average temperature of Earth is 289 Kelvin, find its emissivity. So we're working in a bit of a different direction here. Average temperature is 289 Kelvin, we have to determine emissivity. All right, so let's do that. So this is a new example. Um, average temperature is 289 Kelvin, so a little bit higher than what we had in the previous example, but that's fine. All right, so let's think about how to do this. We are looking for emissivity. Now, from a few slides ago, you saw that emissivity we can calculate as the power radiated by a body divided by the power emitted if it was a black body. So what it really is versus what is ideal, right? And I know that ideally, I've got a certain formula for that. Ideally, this is going to be sigma a t to the 4, right? That's the ideal black body. And so I can figure that out for the Earth based on this temperature. And I know the area that's going to be 4 pi r squared, where r is the radius of the Earth, sigma is a constant. Okay, so the question is, where do I get p body from? Where do I get the power that's actually radiated by the body? Well, you find that out from the previous example. We found in the previous example that the power emitted well, rather, sorry, the power that is incident, that is received by the Earth is, so the power received, we found it to be 1.23 times 10 to the 17 watts. Now, again, we're not told anything about the potential emissivity of the Earth. So for now, we are assuming that this is a perfect black body, which means if this is how much power is received, that means it has to also emit the same amount. And the amount of power that gets emitted is the power of the body that goes in this formula right here. 
So 1.23 times 10 to the 17 watts goes in the numerator, and sigma AT to the 4 goes on the denominator. So sigma, again, 5.67 times 10 to the minus 8. Uh, area is 4 pi r squared, so r is 6.38 times 10 to the 6. And that's squared. And then we have t to the 4. t is 289. All right, so just got to enter all this. Here we go. 1.23 times 10 to the 17 divided by 5.67 times 10 to the minus 8 times 4 pi times 6.38 times 10 to the 6 squared times 289 to the power 4. Okay, so we get 0 0.607, so 0 0.61 approximately. Okay, so this is the emissivity. Okay, this is the emissivity of the Earth. Hopefully that's okay. Let's go back to the slides. All right, so here's a potential multiple choice sample problem. The diagram below shows a simplified model of the energy balance for the Earth. Okay, the albedo of the Earth according to this model is equal to, okay, so we've got four choices here. So remember, albedo means how much of the radiation is reflected compared to how much is coming in. Now, there's a lot of stuff going on here. We have 340 watts per square meter coming in. Okay, that's incident radiation toward the Earth. And from that 340, 100 gets reflected, 240 is radiated from the Earth, which means 240 was originally um, absorbed by the Earth. Now it's re-radiating it. And then from that 240 that gets re-radiated, another two from that comes back, right, reflects from the atmosphere, comes back down toward the Earth. But even though there's so much information here, don't get sidetracked. Remember, albedo is just how much is reflected compared to how much came in. And the amount that is reflected is 100. The amount that came in is 340. And so if you do reflected divided by incident, you're going to have 100 over 340. That is B. And so B is the correct answer here. And so on the slides, you're going to see the explanation using P scattered, P incident, same idea. Okay, so I know I keep saying reflected, and I'm so used to saying reflected as opposed to scattered, but it's similar. It's almost the same. Okay. All right, moving on to the greenhouse effect. All right, so the greenhouse effect is named because what's going on in the earth is very similar to how a greenhouse works also very similar to how heat gets trapped in your car in the summer and so what is the point of a greenhouse the point of a greenhouse is to keep relatively stable temperature where the plants are so they grow very well okay so you need a relatively uh constant temperature as opposed to having very high temperature during the day a very low temperature at night and then various weather changes can also affect that. So what that means is you have all these plants inside a enclosed glass setting. So when the radiation passes through the glass, and so the radiation comes in, the plants absorb it, it re-emits it as infrared radiation, and that radiation cannot escape. Okay, kind of like when you have your car sitting in a parking lot in the summer. Okay, so the radiation enters through the glass of your car, it cannot be, uh, well, it cannot escape in the car once it goes inside. Once you have the radiation enter through the windows, the well, various things inside the car can absorb the heat. It will re-emit the radiation, usually at a longer wavelength, lower energy, and that's generally in the form of infrared radiation, heat, and that doesn't escape. Okay, so the same thing happens with our atmosphere. So instead of having the glass of our car or the glass of the greenhouse, we have the atmosphere. Okay, so you have various types of radiation that are coming in from the sun. And you have the radiation getting absorbed from the earth. You have other radiation getting reflected. But focusing on the radiation that is absorbed by the earth, when it re-emits that radiation, it will usually be in these longer wavelengths. Okay, so it will convert it to infrared, which is heat. Hence, if that heat cannot escape from the atmosphere, it gets trapped inside the Earth, which is why the Earth would be uh, heating up slowly. Okay, so all of that is shown here. 
Okay, moving on to the next slide. Okay, so this slide, um, the picture on the slide demonstrates the greenhouse effect. Now, what most people don't know is that there is actually a very common type of greenhouse gas out there. Okay, so usually when people hear the word green, words greenhouse gases, they think of uh, things emitted by uh, you know, combusting fossil fuels, so you have a lot of pollution. And yes, that is an example of greenhouse gases. I mean, even methane. Methane is an example of a greenhouse gas. Carbon dioxide, absolutely. But what you probably didn't know is that water vapor is actually a really significant greenhouse gas. And you can even see it in the picture here. Okay, so water can evaporate from the oceans into the atmosphere. It can then be redeposited as rain. But it's a huge factor. When you have water vapor present in the atmosphere, it can absorb energy. It can absorb the radiation and re-emit it as infrared radiation. I mean, this is sometimes what's called the humidity factor. So like it or not, water vapor, water itself is a greenhouse gas alongside methane, carbon dioxide, and nitrous oxide. Now, as for contributions to this temperature change in the earth, there are both natural contributions and there are man-made contributions. Now, man-made are usually referenced as anthropogenic and natural, well, that doesn't really go by another name. Let's keep going. And so this graph shows the correlation between increasing atmosphere concentration of carbon dioxide and our fossil fuel emissions of carbon dioxide. And so what you can see is that the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is, was already going up, even from when this data was first collected. Between 1750 and 1850, before um, anthropogenic emissions, before humans started emitting um, well, these greenhouse gases, it was still increasing, but notice that it increased much faster and at a higher rate once we started contributing to this as well. Okay, in fact, it's grown exponentially fast since, well, about the 1970s, 1980s. Okay, so let's try to figure out well, what happened here around the 1800s, around the mid-1800s. Um, well, humans started burning coal for trains and for factories. Now we burn coal for electricity, and our electricity demands have gone up substantially. So that's another reason why you have this sudden jump. Okay. The reason why this graph was increasing in the first place is due to what we just saw on the previous slide. There are natural ways for this to occur. Okay. There are natural ways for the carbon dioxide concentration to increase in the atmosphere. We're going to take a look at this in a lot more detail in the next slide. And the next slide is, in fact, the last slide for this video. Okay. How are the levels of carbon dioxide determined? Observatories and aircraft. Now, what I want you to do, actually, let's just focus on the graph on the left here. Take a look. You notice that the year is 2003. Oh, it just changed to 2004. It's going to hit 2005. And if you notice, this graph, while it's oscillating up and down as the years and the date increases, the overall graph in the overall curve is going to higher and higher Y values, higher and higher levels of carbon dioxide, depending on, well, the sign of the latitude, which you can just interpret as the latitude here. Okay, so this animated graph, you see it's starting at 2000 again. At 2000, it's a very low concentration, and it's slowly going up as the years go on. Now, what you that, that part probably makes sense, why the overall curve is moving upward. What probably doesn't make sense is why this thing is oscillating up and down. And if you really pay close attention to the months, it is oscillating up in certain types of months and it is oscillating down in other types of months. Okay? Specifically, if you watch, it's oscillating up when it's colder and it's oscillating down when it's warmer. Now, when I'm saying colder and warmer, I'm referring to the Northern Hemisphere. Okay, so fall, winter months, it's going up, okay? and spring and summer months, it's going down. Okay, so that is shown a little bit better in this graph right here. Okay, so you can see that the uh, carbon dioxide emissions, uh, they're fluctuating up and down all the time, but the average is this black line right here, and its general trend is going up. All right, so what we know is that the cooling months, there is a rise in carbon dioxide levels. And in the warmer months, there is a decrease in carbon dioxide levels. 
So just pause the video for a second and try to think about what that is, why that is. By the way, something I forgot to mention, this slide is not in your package. Okay, so sometimes slides that I have on my screen, they are not in your package. So this is more for your information. If you want, you can always take notes. It is important to know um, that otherwise don't worry about it. I'll still go through it and explain it. So again, pause the video if you want to just ponder that for a moment. Why are the carbon dioxide emissions increasing when it's colder and decreasing when it's warmer? All right, welcome back. Hopefully you had a chance to pause the video and think about that. If you didn't, I really strongly encourage you to do so. It develops some of those critical thinking skills. All right, so while this is a really complex process, scientists have come to a pretty reasonable conclusion. And that is that in the warmer months, there is more breathing from plants. Okay, so in the warm months, plants start to grow again. In the winter, they shed their leaves and they're barren branches and trees. But in the warm months, you have the leaves, you have vegetation, you have flora, you have fauna, and these are able to absorb carbon dioxide to go through photosynthesis and make their water, sugar, and oxygen. And so they use carbon dioxide. Now, while they do emit a little bit of carbon dioxide themselves, this usually gets reabsorbed. And so that's why the amount of carbon dioxide decreases in the warm months, but it increases in the cooler months. So overall, though, you can see that uh, the trend is unfortunately going up faster than it would have naturally. So we are going to stop there for today. That is the end of 8.2 Thermal Energy Transfer, video 2 of 3. Stay tuned next time for video 3 of 3.